All right, today our, um, our focus is going to be on Buddha's attempt to find knowledge within rather than, as so many of us have been taught to do, by, by looking for it outside of ourselves. And we'll look and see what the implications of that are for, for his perspective. Now, now, last time we looked at some of the uh, conclusions from his own meditation. Uh, his, his, you know, the big one that carries us over is the notion that all of life uh, it involves suffering. It is suffering, suffering of various kinds. If you're looking for some way to describe everybody's life that, that finds out what we have in common, uh, suffering is the thing. Uh, and not just the stuff that set him off at the outset, people getting sick and losing their powers and then finally dying and rotting away, but that was one of the things which he only discovered in his late 20s because he was so overprotected. Uh, but the other kinds of suffering, the kinds of suffering that people know along the way. He, he talks a lot about relational suffering. You know, you desire a relationship with someone that doesn't work, or you have a relationship with something, someone and it's lost and, and you suffer because of it. Uh, it has to do with things you hope to accomplish and do not or cannot. Uh, just uh, all along the way, there are reasons to think of for suffering. Now, to some extent, that runs against the grain of people who are just perpetually optimistic. There's something about many people's memory that only remembers the good things from the past. You know, the old days are, for many people, always the good old days. You know, that's, that's what they remember. And so he, he flips around that customary pattern and thinks about all the terrible things. You know. And if you took a little while and, and made a list of all the times that, that bad things have happened to you or those you love, you come up with quite a list, probably. But odds are that's not prominent in your thinking. Uh, different people have tried to explain why that's so, but it does seem to be so. Now, as Buddha began to think about the suffering of the other people, what happened was, uh, according to some accounts at least, was that he got out of his own problems and began to realize that other people had problems. And he is thought of as one of the most compassionate people uh, in terms of his, his impact on those around him and the memories that they have. It's this it's this focusing on the suffering of other people that becomes primary in, in, in his thought. And so when he achieves nirvana, that, that complete overcoming of his individuality, at which point he could have gone on to whatever one goes on to next, you know, from depending on which of the Indian perspectives you interpret uh, his thought in, uh, he decided to hang around because what he knew was so important, everybody needed to know it. And so he became, uh, you see the word here, a bodhisattva, uh, one who could have gone on to nirvana, but who decides to stay and share the insights of his, of his enlightenment with others. So he hangs around for several more decades and then dies of apparently a food poisoning one day. Um, and, and that's the end of his life story. But in the process now, we were introduced last time to the Four Noble Truths. They are a standard way to sum up his perspective on suffering and to give us the transition for how to overcome it. And so his first noble truth is that, uh, you, you see them listed in a, in a kind of a contemporary fashion on page 50 in your textbook. The, the, the four noble truths start out with the notion that suffering is the most important aspect of existence. Uh, everybody suffers. Uh, all people suffer. Uh, all the events of life are marked by suffering. Even if in some particular event you're doing pretty well, probably somebody else is suffering there. Uh, maybe because you're doing so well. Um, so all of life is marked by suffering. Now here's, here's the big transition we run across. Why? Why is all of life marked by suffering? And this is a very distinctive answer. What is his answer? Why? Does suffering mark all of our lives? People are greedy and self-centered. Self what kind of, how, how do we explain how, how that resides in people's nature? Why are people greedy and self-centered? Well, his answer is ultimately like that of some other Indian thinkers. Um, they have picked up 
You know, people who are self-centered like that have picked up some really bad habits in their upbringing. Expectations, habits of expectation. Uh, you are raised, most of you, uh, not just to go out and seek happiness or, and fulfillment, but to fit in to, to the whole pattern of, of getting power and translating that into money. And that's what people are taught. That's what they were taught then. Their situation was often more dire than ours. Most of us don't worry about missing meals, at least not for lack of money, maybe lack of time <laughs> once in a while. Um, but people set out with this, uh, this set of, of things they think will fulfill them, and, and they pursue those, and they are all very self-centered kinds of things. Uh, most people do not set out, you know, get up in the morning and think, ah, what can I do today to make the world a better place? What can I do to relieve the suffering of others? What can I do to show love to others, to express my compassion in concrete? We're just not that way. We're, we're different kind of folks. And, uh, and, and in the larger realm of Buddhist and Hindu thought in general, you can make a place for a period of preparation and separate that from, from a period of actually going out and enacting your compassion. So it, it's not... It is not that it, on every single day preparation is to be dismissed and just go ahead and be compassionate. I mean, there is a place in all of this for preparing yourself to be even better. But, and what, what Buddha says here is the first thing you need to do in order to develop the same kind of compassionate nature he's talking about uh, is to look within. And so his first noble truth is that everything in life has to do with suffering. All of life is suffering. That, that's the interpretive category if you miss that interpretive category, you only have a partial understanding of what's going on in your life and the lives of others. It is primarily caused by tanha. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, an old uh, Indian word that means thirst. You know, thirst in the sense of the things you really, really desire. Uh, you know, we have a, a line in, in uh, a Christian tradition about hunger and thirsting after righteousness. And, you know, those are the ones Jesus says are blessed. And, and Buddha is convinced that most people thirst after other things <laughs> than, than righteousness. Yeah, they, they focus, they, they, they hunger and thirst or thirst for uh, selfish kinds of things. And that's why they suffer. So they don't suffer because in the terms we were talking about before, somehow a powerful and compassionate job has been asleep at the switch. They suffer because of their own nature. It's an internal problem, and the solution to an internal problem, then, will be an internal solution. And so one is to look within. He is convinced that if we could remove this element of thirst or desire from our lives, we would not suffer, or at least not nearly so much. That suffering is always the disappointment of our expectations. And the expectations, well, those are things we generate and can have control over, if we will. So all of life is suffering. It's caused by certain kinds of desires, and you can begin to change yourself to get those desires out. And then the question is how? And he says, you know, in, in essence, the fourth noble truth is uh, uh, the lead-in or the intro to what is called the Eightfold Path. Now, the Eightfold Path, you, you see, again, a rather a two contemporary uh, portrayals of it on, on page 51. Um, and, and, and I don't want to talk about each of the eight here, although we'll answer questions about it later if we need to. Let me focus on, on uh, kind of the central themes there, because this is connected in some ways with what we've seen earlier. It's similar, for example, to what Aristotle said. One of the things he says is, if you want to change your, you know, if, if you discover what's going on in your life that needs to be changed, and you want to change that, you can work at it. And the way to work at it is by starting uh, to do things differently day by day until it gets to be habit, until it gets to be second nature. The way to change yourself, your character, your expectations, is to change the way you live today and tomorrow and the next day and so on. And pretty soon, Doing those things makes you into a different kind of person. And not doing the things you were do doing before, substituting for them better things, will make you into a different kind of person. Now, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stuff at the outset 
uh, is in, in the Eightfold Path, those eight items, are just kind of standard religious teaching, moral teaching, whatever. There are things that you should do if you're a good person. And there are things you should not do if you're a good person. You know, he'll say, you know, do away with, with killing and stealing and lying and, and unchastity is a common, <laughs> common uh, translation for that, for that word. And also do away with intoxicants. One of the things that marks Buddhism is separating itself from the use of, of alcohol and also of this hallucinogenic whatever it was that uh, a lot of the Indians were using um, uh, and probably possibly a, a mushroom derivative that marked a lot of, of Indian use. But don't do that because the point of life is to clarify your thinking and, and direct your life in a particular way. And if you do things that kind of mute or numb the thinking, uh, that will not be helpful. Uh, and so, for the most part, <clears throat> Buddhists tend to avoid, still, uh, alcohol. Now, not universally. I mean, nobody. <laughs> No group of people avoids it universal. It has this enticing power. And so wherever you go, uh, you know, Baptists used to think they were non-drinkers and then you discovered, well, that was not so. Even Mormons and so on in this country. But you go around the world, there are Muslims who will violate Muhammad's teachings at that point, you know, and have a drink. And there are Buddhists who will do that and do so rather openly because Buddhism is, generally speaking, a little more loose-knit than some of the other religious communities. But they do avoid it. And the funniest story I've ever heard about that was when we were in Russia one time. Um, and we were, we were in St. Petersburg, and there's this large column in one of the squares there, uh, this, this tall uh, column of stone that you know, was turned and polished and erected there with a statue on the top. And the guide and, and other guides on subsequent trips have told the very same story. So it's one of their favorite stories. He said, well, this, this statue was put up here in the middle of winter. And you know what winters are like in St. Petersburg, so cold. And so they had to mix the cement with vodka so that it wouldn't freeze. You know? <laughs> well, it, it's probably not a true story, but it's, a, it's, it's an interesting story. And then the, that first guide led into this other story. She said, it was a good thing. It was a good thing this was a Christian nation or there wouldn't have been any vodka. He said, back at one time, when the czars were trying to decide what would be the official religion, he said there were three major religions represented in the country. There was Islam, and they didn't drink. And there were the Buddhists, and they didn't drink. And there were the Christians, and they liked their vodka. And so the czar, for that reason, chose Christianity as the official national religion. <laughs> well, again, it's a story that's almost certainly not true, but it, but it makes a good story. And does point out this, this cultural difference between, between some folks who make that a, a significant element uh, in their lives. And it makes sense, really, for Buddha, because when people suffer, they often do try to block the suffering, and Buddha wants to solve the suffering and get it out and provide a different way of living. And so... Uh, that, that's, that's one of, the, uh, one of the things he recommends. He also says you need to pay attention to what kind of job you have. There are some jobs that are just immoral by nature. Now, this, again, is not an original thing with him. We find this uh, among un other Indian thinkers. Uh, for example, people who make poison. You know, because poison, of course, it can be used to kill people, but it's also used to kill any living being. And, and in the Indian perspective, a soul is a soul is a soul. It's a scrap of life that should be protected, and, uh, which is why so many Hindus are, are, are vegetarians, and so many Buddhists are also vegetarians, although Buddhists are a little less likely to be so. Uh, they try, but they're not as typically as radical about it. When the Dalai Lama was here on campus and we had this nice lunch, they served a salad with strips of beef on top uh, over here in the dining hall. And, uh, I looked over and he was eating his. You know. and so we asked later and he said, well, I tried very hard to be a vegetarian and the doctor said there were certain nutrients I was not getting it was affecting my health. So I eat meat and small pork, you know, sort of the standard thing that a lot of people do when they try to be vegetarians and have trouble maintaining it. But, but I thought it was interesting. He thought it was important you know, to respect those lives, but not absolutely you know, important in, in terms of being practical about life. Now, those are kind of the standard things as we move up to it. But the last one on the list moves us into meditation, which is a big topic in Indian thought and particularly big 
in Buddhism as it has moved into other parts of the world. Uh, particularly the version we associate with uh, the, the Vajrayana Buddhists, the ones that the, uh, the, the Dalai Lama is connected with, who are in Tibet and, and other India and other places, and China. Um, uh, and, and also uh, Zen Buddhists, and to some extent monks in any kind of Buddhism, will spend a lot of time in meditation. And understanding what that meditation is, is a key element of Buddhism and those branches of other Indian religions that, that focus on it, or, or those, those forms of life in, in other Indian religions. Now, most of you probably don't meditate. Uh, there, are, there are traditions of religious meditation in every single major religious tradition in the world. Uh, Jews, Christians, Muslims, as well as folks in Asia and elsewhere in that part of the world have always known people in their midst who, who meditated. Uh, they did it for a variety of reasons. Christians, for example, often meditated so they could focus their attention entirely upon Christ or entirely upon God for a while and block out everything else. The Buddhist meditation tries to focus not on something out there, but on something within. And in that way, it's true to Indian thought uh, that, ha that was developing this in, in other forms of, of yoga. Uh, there, there are different kinds of yoga, but one of them depends on meditating. Uh, and there's the transcendental meditation, which has been popular in the Western world, which is kind of stripped of most religious overtones and done as a kind of a practical how to help you focus your willpower and attention and so on. Uh, I, I remember one of the, you know, when, when you're a student for a long time, as one is when one collects graduate degrees and then stays on the campus, uh, it seemed like every year there were more books to read, more papers to write. It got harder and harder and harder. It got better, but it got harder, and there were just not enough hours in the day. And I remember reading some of those little books and articles that would help you kind of focus your attention, control your attention, set the goals and achieve them. And when I, when I would later read some of the teachings of Buddha or, or, or some of the teachings of, of the Hindu traditions that, that focus on meditation, uh, like the, the, the Raja Yoga or the Royal Yoga, it, it, it has those elements in it. I mean, just, just as a practical matter, uh, think of some recent time when you have tried to accomplish something, you know, to write something or to finish reading something or to do something like that, and how difficult it could be, how distracting the world is, and how distracting your customary habits are. You know, you're in the middle of writing paper, but you've got a habit of watching a particular show at a particular time, and so, you know, you just close the book and go watch a show or something. It's, it's as if those habits are the most important things in a person's life. Now, people who teach meditation, religious or secular, will deal with that. Because if the truth is within, you need to develop the ability to focus on the truth within and block whatever's coming from without. And it's not something that comes easily. In fact, I think probably only a small percentage of the population has, you know, kind of the wherewithal to, to maintain that, judging on the, you know, the, the number of great failures of people who try. <laughs> um, but think for a minute what it would mean if you could get that kind of control. How would you do it? Well, there's several things. I mean, first of all, you've got the, the first seven of the Eightfold Path. You know, take care of the moral issues. You know, make sure the way you're living is not somehow objectionable or distracting or bad in itself. Now begin to look within. They do it in several different ways. Uh, the most common ways are to focus on some individual thing. Perhaps an object. Perhaps light a candle. Or, or perhaps gaze upon some object that's meaningful. Or, in some versions, uh, get your master uh, to give you a little sound you can utter, a mantra. And the sound may have a meaning, like you've heard the one, Om, which is supposed to be the creative, in, in Hindu thought, the creative word uttered by God when the earth was created, and so a powerful tone. Or it may be a meaningless term, which may be better so that a person's not thinking about the meaning of the word, but rather using that to focus or fix the attention. Because the more you fix your attention on something, the less you will be distracted by something else without and even by your own habits. It becomes an intense focus. Now, in, yes? 
uh, in, in some versions, in, in some versions of this fixating on that single object or single word or thing or idea, uh, you repeat the, the word, say the mantra, uh, audibly, and other times you, then you get to the point where you, where you repeat it only internally, quietly to yourself. You, you do all the things like get in the right kind of position, the lotus position, which is very uncomfortable for us, but is seemingly quite comfortable for people who start young doing it. <laughs> Sit down cross-legged with your feet actually up on the other legs with the bottoms of the feet pointed up, you know. And, and sitting, and perhaps in, in, after the fashion of some Zen Buddhists, you sit that way and turn to the wall so that you're not distracted by anything going on around here. But by focusing on one thing, one tone, or something like that, uh, you really marshal all your mental powers until they're all there, and not thinking about lunch, or your boyfriend or girlfriend, or your job, or your next meal. All those things begin to fall away. And then, in some versions, something else happens. You recognize that between your own fixed mental powers and the thing on which they are focused, there is really no difference. That the barriers of individuality that set you apart from the thing you're gazing at. Say, for example, I've, I've seen people do this with a candle. They light a single candle in an otherwise dark room and focus on that. And after a while, there is no difference, they say, in myself and the candle on which I'm focusing. And we can explain that intellectually in that the only thing we know about the candle is that set of mental images we develop in here. We don't really, you know, we don't really have direct contact through, I mean, to the candle other than through our senses into images and all the language and stuff that's associated with thinking about it and interpreting it. But the point there is that perhaps all the things that make us different are illusions. And what we really should get to is what everyone has in common. And that becomes kind of the divine goodness within all of us and within all things. And so perhaps by shearing away bad habits, distracting thoughts, bad goals, you finally take all these things off like so many layers of peeling on an onion until you get down to what's really there. And what's really there is your inherent goodness, which has been blocked from your view and from the view of others by all of these bad habits and other things that got pasted on top. Now, you can't get there simply doing what somebody else tells you. Sooner or later, this is one of those things you got to do for yourself. You know, nobody can teach you. For, I mean, there are simple things people can't teach you. People can't teach you the multiplication tables. You know, sooner or later, you've got to sit down and memorize them for yourself if you're going to. Do people even do that anymore? <laughs> but, but then there are more complex things that you've just got to learn for yourself. They can't be taught. A teacher can, can put something in front of you, can ask the hard questions, can give you a goal to accomplish and threaten to grade you badly if you, you know. <laughs> but sooner or later, you have to sit down and do it yourself. Well, not only that. Is this something that's intensely personal and requires your great effort to do that? Um, but once you have, have done that, you suddenly have a, you know, a different view of the world um, and, and of yourself as, as all of this other stuff flow, fall, falls away. Um, when the sage asks questions, you know, mentioned the sound of one hand clapping last time, which, you know, turned the page, it was right there. And then the, the uh, arrow th smeared thickly with poison is also there uh, in your book close to the end of the chapter, or a, a small version of it. Uh, when the sage asks questions, they may do that as, as a way of helping you get back uh, within you and find what's, what's really there. Um, but then the question is, how in the modern world do, do we characterize what happens there. And so, and so I'll make a suggestion, and we'll talk about this just in a, in a moment, that this is a way of, of gaining freedom. That most people are enslaved to bad habits and bad ideas. And I said at the beginning of the semester that the sort of the Western view 
of overcoming this slavery to feelings and bad goals and bad ideas and all that is to be rational. That the best way to be free is to be rational, not to be prisoner or slave to your emotions and feelings. And so to the extent you can develop reason, rational, uh, rational thinking, uh, rational thinking, logical thinking, the Western philosopher thinks you will get freedom. Buddha is more convinced that it has to do with getting rid of all that stuff which comes from the outside. It's not somebody else's logic you need to know. It's your own inner goodness. Uh, and peel away the bad habits as you focus on that. And the essence of mysticism comes through in this sense. If, if you were to ask questions you know, about why should I believe it so, I said, well, you know, really maybe you shouldn't. The only way for you to understand this is to experience it for yourself. I mean, not only do you have to do it yourself, you cannot even fully explain it to anybody else. And every mystical tradition, and there are lots of mystical traditions in religion, say that. You'll never understand it until it becomes a part of your beliefs. And then it will take on dimensions that, that can never be translated from one person's experience to another. Uh, and so we get this very interesting mystical aspect here. Uh, questions come up along the way. People ask the Buddha, so do we have a soul? And he said, eh, it's not an important question. Get to work on, on your character. Oh, so you're saying there's no soul. Eh, that's not an important question. <laughs> so people get, well, is there a soul or is there none? And he refused to talk about that much of the time. That, that was not part of the business at hand. It, and, and so this notion of nirvana, this extinction of individuality in this life or, or beyond, did not depend on those traditional categories. And so he would dismiss them. What about the gods? What about the creation and all that? That's not important. Look to yourself. Uh, focus on finding your inner self, uh, setting it free. Okay, well, we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Uh, thank you.